We are, as those of you who will have been here for some Sundays, realize in the midst of seeking to discover the message of the Sermon on the Mount for our own lives today, and we are at chapter 5 of Matthew, therefore, and turning this evening to the second part of what Matthew records in the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus' teaching on the law of God. Now, such a title as that might at first hearing seem to be a major irrelevance to people in the 1980s on such an evening as this. What can it possibly do for us to consider together Jesus' teaching on the law of God? But I hope that we may discover that it is anything but irrelevant for us to be turning to such a section of Scripture as this. Indeed, in so many ways, I think that in our contemporary world, for our contemporary lives, there is probably nothing that is more relevant than this particular teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure I must have quoted to you more than once before the words of John Newton, author of many great hymns and former slave trader. He says, Ignorance of the nature and design of the law is at the bottom of most of our religious mistakes. Ignorance of the nature and design of the law is at the bottom of most of our religious mistakes. Now, the reason for that statement being true is really quite simple. It is that the first mark, the common feature of the life of truly born-again Christian people is that they will have in the deepest realm of their lives a desire to live in and for the will of God. That's the thing that will matter to them ultimately more than anything else in the world. Their great question will be, how can I live my life so as to please and honor God most? I say again, that's the great characteristic of the life of the true believer. It is not the mark of the life of the unbeliever. He has other priorities, other questions, other things matter to him infinitely more. But for the true believer, that is the great issue of life, and it's the biggest difference that God's grace makes. Now the question, therefore, is to such a person, where do I find the will and pleasure of God to be revealed? Where do I look for it? And the answer is in His commandments. He has given us an account of His will and pleasure and purpose in His moral law. And then the question arises, where would I look for instruction in how the commandments of God relate to me as a Christian man or woman? And the answer to that question would be in the teaching of Jesus. So you see, this area of the Sermon on the Mount is of intense relevance to us if we are believing Christians this evening. It touches the core of what will matter to us most if we are truly Christian people. And in this particular section, our Lord Jesus Christ is engaged in an exposition of the law of God. That is what he is doing at this particular part of his sermon. Verses 17 to 21 of Matthew 5 are the introduction, in some ways, to the subject. And last week we looked together at that. 
There Jesus speaks of the relation to the law of himself, of his disciples, and of the Pharisees. He himself is related to the law in that he fulfills it. The disciples are to be related to the law in that they are to keep it and teach it. I tell you the truth. He says, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus' relationship to the law is that he fulfills it. The disciples' relation to it is they are to keep it and to teach it. And the Pharisees' relationship to the law which enters again and again into Jesus' teaching, is that they have distorted it. They have externalized it so that their interest is in the outward act rather than the inward spirit, and in so many other ways they have distorted the law of God. But with that background from verses 17 to 21, Jesus now turns at verse 21 to expound and apply the law of God to his disciples. Let me just emphasize as we come to this section that Jesus is not rejecting the Old Testament in general or the law of God in particular and replacing it, as people have often thought, with something a little less severe. It was said of old by them, but I say to you. What Jesus is saying is something quite different from that. But you will find that there are many people who quote this particular part of the Sermon on the Mount and say, it's obvious what Jesus is doing. He is taking up the Old Testament and the strictures of the law of the Old Testament, and he's saying that's what was said in Old Testament days, but now I show you a better way. I say unto you, and he is contradicting the law and the Old Testament in order to replace it. If you look more closely at the text, which is always a very important thing to do when you're studying the Bible, If you look at it more closely, you will see that this is precisely not what Jesus is doing. From verse 21, there are six examples that Jesus gives in his exposition of the law. If you have a new international version, they very conveniently head the paragraphs according to the theme. And the themes are murder, adultery, divorce, oaths, an eye for an eye, and love for your enemies. They are all introduced in almost the same way. If you look at verses 21, 27, 31, 33, 38, and 43, they begin like this. Verse 21 You have heard that it was said to the people long ago. And then, verse 22, but I tell you. Again in verse 27, you have heard that it was said, verse 28, but I tell you. And so it goes on right through these six examples that Jesus takes up. Now what Jesus is doing in each case, and here's the importance of looking at it carefully, is not saying, this is what the Old Testament teaches, but I say to you. He does not say, you have read that it was written, which is his way of quoting Scripture. He says, you have heard that it was said, which is his way of quoting tradition. So the difference between what Jesus is quoting and Jesus is teaching is not the difference between Old Testament law and Jesus' replacement of it. It is rather the traditions that have accrued around the Old Testament law from the teachers and scribes and Pharisees and Jesus' exposition of the Old Testament law. So he is not challenging the law, but rather misinterpretations of it. 
the teachers of the law had often added to or subtracted from Scripture. Let me give you quickly an example of the latter, how they added to Scripture. Turn to the last of these examples in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, you will have little difficulty in finding the first half of that quotation in the Old Testament. If you do have difficulty in finding it, it's in Leviticus chapter 19. But you will have a great deal of difficulty in finding the second half of that quotation for the simple reason that it does not occur in the Old Testament. So what have the scribes and teachers of the law been doing? They have been adding to the Scripture. What Jesus is therefore doing is not challenging the law, but a misinterpretation, misuse of the law by the teachers of the law, which has led to its distortion. Let me give you an example of this in the third paragraph on taking oaths. Oaths were intended in the Old Testament, of course, to encourage truthfulness. That's the whole point of Old Testament oaths. Again, you have heard verse 33, that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. Now, the whole point of that commandment and provision was to encourage truthfulness. But the Pharisees used this very area of the law to avoid truthfulness. You get an example of that further over in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 23 at verse 16. It's worth your while turning over to that. Here is Jesus pronouncing woe on the teachers of the law and the Pharisees in verse 15. And then in verse 16 of Matthew 23, he says, Woe to you, blind guides! You say, If anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. Now, you see the point of taking oaths in order to avoid truth and telling the truth. So they said, If when we swear, we say, I swear by the temple, that doesn't mean a thing. You don't take me seriously, and I'm not bound by that oath. So they're using an oath for the opposite purpose for which God gave it. Read on. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. That's part of the tradition. You blind fools, says Jesus, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also swear. If anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift, the offering on the altar, he is bound by his oath. And so he goes on. You can see the kind of extraordinary twisting of words and ideas that the Pharisees engaged in. Their abuse of the law was so as to avoid the very thing that the law was insisting upon. Now, that is the kind of abuse that Jesus is seeking to lead them away from when he says, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Now, there are two main emphases in what Jesus says in these examples, and I want to turn to them with you now, spending the greater part of our time in the first. The first is the new depth of Jesus' challenge, and the second is the new focus of Jesus' emphasis. And it's these two things that I want to use as a help to enable us to find our way through the rest of this teaching. First of all, the new depth of Jesus' challenge. Now, you can see that immediately. I'm sure it was apparent to you in our Scripture reading from the first two examples that Jesus takes up, the commandments about murder and adultery. He is obviously drawing our attention away from the outward act to the inward attitude. 
So the commandment, do not murder, is one in which Jesus sees beyond the outward act of actually assaulting and murdering somebody to the bitter root in the heart of the person who commits that act, which corrodes the heart and calls down upon it the judgment of God. But Jesus says the thing that really disturbs God is not the outward act which is the end of the process, but the bitter root of anger and bitterness from which it springs. And you will notice how Jesus puts it in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. So as long as they kept back their hand from actually committing murder, they were perfectly smug and self-satisfied. But Jesus says, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Now I think it's of great significance that Jesus turns our attention at this point to the words that we use. Clearly there is such a thing as righteous wrath. God possesses it. But in the kind of relationships that Jesus is speaking about, he is describing that anger which comes out in our words in verse 22. When he says, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now the point about both of these words is not, I think, that we should go into the detail of what their background is and so on this evening. The simple point is that they are expressions which belittle and demean and hurt and wound people so that it is possible to commit murder without actually striking a blow with your hand. You can do it with your tongue. We even use the phrase character assassination, we call it. And Jesus says, it is this that concerns and distresses and draws forth my anger and judgment, rather than simply the outward action. I think it's in his excellent book, which I embarrass him grossly by telling you, you ought to buy, called Kingdom Life in a Fallen World, uh, the Sermon on the Mount that Sinclair Ferguson says, it is possible to have murder without knives. Now that's a very significant thing. And this whole language, Raka, you fool, is of great significance, I think, for us right into the heart of June 1988 in our daily living. You see, there is a particularly ugly expression of this when you are in a position of power and people are in some sense under your power and control. We can assassinate people in so many different ways by the words that we use and by making life hell for them. Now, I am hearing of this constantly, let me say to you this evening, my dear friends, not just from the secular world, but from people who are under employment or leadership by Christians who engage in this kind of bitter, cutting, wounding language and demean and belittle others. One clearly imagines, because they have a profound sense of insecurity themselves, it is never the mark of the secure person that they need to belittle and demean others. 
It is always the mark of the person who feels threatened. And it's a solemn thing. The only answer to it, says Jesus, is repentance and reconciliation and a new concern for the heart. Not for the outward act, that's Phariseeism, but for the heart. And that repentance and reconciliation, Jesus says, particularly needs to be exercised in two places. One, at verse 23, going to church. Two, verse 25, going to court. Verse 23, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember your brother has something against you, leave the gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. That is, if there is something being harbored in the nature nature of bitterness between two believers, then, says Jesus, Obedience is what matters to God, not just your presence at the place of worship. Obedience, heart obedience. Get rid of that bitterness. Put it right with your brother and then go and worship. And your worship will be acceptable to God. Worship divorced from morality all through the Bible is very offensive to the God of the Bible. The second place is going to court. And here, Jesus is speaking obviously about the urgency of reconciliation, of putting matters right between people, of not allowing this bitterness to fester, because you know that's what happens to wrong relationships, to bitterness of spirit, to a heart that is filled with resentment, it begins to fester. And Jesus says, therefore, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. And the whole point of the illustration is that harbored resentment needs to be dealt with quickly. So there is the first place where the new depth of Jesus' challenge is illustrated for us. The other is in the next section, which is under the general heading in the NIV, adultery. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you, that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if we can commit murder with our words, we can also commit adultery in our hearts, says Jesus. And again, do notice, he is concerned to take our interest away from the outward act to the inward reality of what is going on in our hearts. Now that leads Jesus to some very practical instruction. In verse 29, the argument is that if physical adultery is the result of heart adultery, and heart adultery is the result of eye adultery, then the only way to deal with the problem is where it begins, namely with the eyes. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. What is Jesus saying? Well, clearly he is not speaking about physical mutilation. What he is speaking about is spiritual mortification. That is, he is saying, if 
such things as this begin in the heart. And if my heart is fed by my eyes, for example, then I need to be absolutely ruthless about what I am feeding my heart upon through the vehicle of my eyes. It's as simple as that. But it is of profound importance. There is no point, you see, in our pleading our difficulty about purity if we are feeding and nourishing our hearts through our eyes upon the kind of thing that will inflame them with lust. That's very obvious, isn't it? We even teach it to the children in that little ditty, be careful, little eyes, what you see. But I tell you, my dear friends, it is not a childish thing to take that counsel with deadly seriousness in the age in which you and I live today. And this is the point at which so often the tide is stemmed that just waits to flood our imagination. And we need to be ruthless with it. Jesus, let me say to you again, is not speaking about self-mutilation. He is speaking about self-denial. Similarly, if my hand causes me to sin, then, says Jesus, I need to be absolutely ruthless with it. This whole subject of mortification, of putting to death the areas where sin is going to make inroads into our lives, is one that our own generation greatly needs to think so much more about. It may be, you see, that people will say to you, Oh, have you not read such and such a book? Have you not been to see such and such a film? What a Philistine you must be culturally. How maimed you are. But Jesus says it is better to enter into life maimed than to enter into hell without it. That's an important thing. And you will be able to apply it, although it's a desperately unpopular thing to say in our own generation. Now, the third area of Jesus' concentration also points up to us the new depth of Jesus' challenge. The depth of that challenge is illustrated in how he expounds the issue of murder in the law of God and adultery in the law of God. And thirdly, in the way he expounds divorce in verses 31 and 32. Now, of course, the great problem in this particular era when Jesus was teaching, was exactly the same problem that we face in our own generation. That is, that marriage was utterly insecure. God had given permission for divorce because of the hardness of people's hearts. But their attitude to divorce did not receive it in the way that God had given it, but instead made marriage a contract of convenience. There were several schools of thought amongst the rabbis in Jesus' time. Rabbi Hillel, for example, said you could divorce your wife if she spoiled your dinner, insulted your father, or failed to look attractive. We smile. 
but aren't we living in an age almost precisely like that today? And what had happened, of course, was that when God permitted divorce for the hardness of people's hearts, although it had never been part of his purpose, bills of divorce were being written at this time with an abandon that was extraordinary. Why? Because God's law was being lightly viewed. And wherever God's law is lightly viewed, precisely this happens. Now, Jesus' emphasis is on the sanctity of the marriage bond and the exceptional nature of divorce. Now, you will notice the balance of his teaching. It has been said, verse 31, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Isn't that an extraordinary thing? There is all that was needed. Anybody who divorces his wife, make sure she gets a certificate. But I tell you, says Jesus, that anyone who divorces his wife, except for this one cause that Scripture allows Jesus permits, that is marital unfaithfulness, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a woman so divorced commits adultery. What is Jesus doing? Well, he is adding a new depth to the challenge about the permanence and exclusiveness of the marriage bond and the exceptional nature of divorce. Now let me turn to the other side of what I was suggesting was the second great emphasis of Jesus' exposition of the law. First, there is this new depth to Jesus' challenge. Then there is the new focus of Jesus' attention. And that focus was on a positive righteousness. You see that, for example, in the section we already looked at in Oaths. What is it that Jesus' great emphasis is upon? Well, look at it in verse 36. He says, I say to you, do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Uh, that means permanently white or black, of course. You will realize he is not speaking about modern tendencies. He is speaking about the natural color of the hair. You cannot make one hair of your head white or black. Do not swear at all, says Jesus in verse 34, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Now, what does this mean? Well, many people have said, because of this, I will never take an oath in court. But that's not what Jesus is talking about what he is speaking about is something that's quite positive, clear, and plain. And he is saying in verse 37, because God himself goes on oath to his people, as you will know. But what Jesus is assaulting, as it were, in this misunderstanding and misuse of the law of God is the lack of integrity in these people. He says, verse 37, simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Now, why that? For the simple reason that he is pleading with them, that they be men and women of their word. That's the vital thing. Let people be able to trust you. Can they? Do they? Are they really able when you say yes to no? He means it. Because you will see that very often an oath is simply a confession that I'm not to be trusted. Honestly, they say, cross my throat, scout's honor, or whatever. Why do people say that? Because they suspect that you don't believe them. Now, it's an important thing for us to take Jesus' word seriously here. Integrity in our dealings with each other is absolutely vital in the kingdom of God. In the commercial world in our time, we have had one great blow up in the city of London where people have given their hand on a bargain and nobody's been able to trust anybody else. And they tell me they've been looking around wondering who is the next man of whom revelations are going to be made. 
Now here is where the Christian stands. He is to be a man of honor, a woman of honor. His word, her word is to be their bond. And that's the positive righteousness that Jesus emphasizes. You get the same emphasis in the next section from verse 38. Where Jesus is speaking about retaliation. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If they want you to go one kilometer, go two kilometers. And so on. Now, you see the point of that. Don't get lost in all the minutiae of what that's going to mean. Have I got to give my overcoat as well as my jacket to somebody if they ask me. Let me deal with the main point first of all, which is this. That Jesus is saying, respond in positive love to people. Now let me come a little closer to the passage itself. You will know, I hope, that this particular commandment was designed by God to limit the dealings of a court with offenders to the realm of absolute justice and fairness. So an eye for an eye was absolute justice and fairness. Vengeance didn't come into it. And that particular commandment clearly is intended For the law court. Now it's a very important thing to recognize that in the New Testament you get this in Romans 13 for example, uh, Romans 12 rather, the law court in scripture is a separate institution from the realm of individual relationships. The law court must never act as though it were an individual It is by God commanded to dispense justice. The individual must never act as though he were a law court seeking vengeance. And that's the great error that enters into many people's relationships. You know the kind of thing. It's human nature. Somebody offends against us. And what do we say? If it's the last thing I do, I'll get him for that. Vengeance is what we are after, you see. Now God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. What is our attitude to be to other people? Well, it is primarily to be what Jesus summarizes our attitude to our neighbor from the law in verse 43, it is to be love. Now, love will therefore prevent us from acting like the law court and seeking personal retaliation. Let me emphasize to you, this does not mean that the Christian will never go to law. What it means is that the Christian will leave to the law court seeking justice and retribution. He will not take that into his own hands. And that's the point of Jesus' words, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you, what is the human natural thing to do? Well, to strike him back. But Jesus says, this is not to be the mark of of the behavior of members of my kingdom. The law court is there to exact justice, and that was the realm to which the commandment was initially given. Uh, Do you notice, by the way, and I don't want to weary you with this, but do you notice that in verses 40 and 41 and 42, love may demand that in some situations... You will give to people, but you may not give them precisely what they ask. Give to the one who asks you, verse 42. That is not necessarily what they ask you for, but give to them nonetheless. 
Let me give you a brief example because people have asked me about this. There are occasions when people come into the vestry and ask me for money. I give you a, an example that is perhaps obvious, but you'll know the point of it. And I uh, have a rather sensitive nose for alcohol and recognize why they are wanting the money. They will say, when I say to them, I'm very sorry, we have a rule and a principle that we never give money to people for this very reason, and I explain to them this would not be Christian love, this would be something that would damage and harm you. So, uh, they will say, well, sir, it's a thing I never do, I never touch a drop, etc. But I know that if I'm going to give money to such a person, which is what they're asking for, I'm going to give them the very thing that will destroy them. And Christian love would prevent me from doing that. But if I give to them in accordance with love, I will give to them not necessarily what they ask, but what may indeed cost me more in other ways and directions. Now you will notice that the whole point of this is a change of attitude of a positive kind, which is summarized in the last section, love your neighbor. And Jesus said, they have added, hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, the whole point of what Jesus is saying in this last section is that we have to behave toward others the way God, our Heavenly Father, behaves toward us. You notice how it's summarized in verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. What does he do? He causes his Son to rise on the evil and good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous and so on. Now, what is Jesus saying? Well, the positive principle that he is laying down here is the principle of belonging to the family of God and having the nature of our Father appearing in our lifestyle. That's the way the law is fulfilled. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing when He is fulfilling prophecy and writing the law of God in our hearts. Now, that's why we will love God's law rather than despise it. He writes it in our hearts in order that we may be like our Heavenly Father. And that's how this part of the sermon closes. Be perfect, therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. That is the positive note of Jesus exposition of the law is that we should have in our lives the nature of our Heavenly Father, and that people will begin to see not a cold morality, but the beauty of the law-keeping Jesus living in His children. And that, of course, will draw their attention, not to us, but to Him. But my beloved friends, it is a change in our behavior that will convince the world that there is a living God, that He is real today, and that He lives through the lives of those He has redeemed. Let's pray together. Our blessed Lord, we give you thanks for your holy word and acknowledge that we could never be different from what we are except your Holy Spirit changed us from within. And this is what we pray for for one another as we commend ourselves to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.